welcome. Uh, this is me and his talk. Uh, so let's get started because there's probably quite a lot to cover uh, and I feel like we're really running out of time. Um, just quickly, me, I work for that company at the top quite recently, um, but I used to be a DevOps engineer in an AWS environment. I'm still doing AWS and Google Cloud at the moment and a WASP. We've got t-shirts printed for today, so come and find us later. They're still in the car. <laughs> Like, I finished these slides between last night and this morning because I was soldering all hours the whole week, uh, thanks to Mike, but anyway. Um, and Tafik, uh, we used to work together. Yeah, some time back, and um, I guess that's me. Um, yeah, work at, currently work at SKA, SA. Um, yeah, that's basically, uh, there's not much. If you want to know more about me, I guess it's best to just talk to me. Yeah, I'm that kind yeah. Yeah, so we we usually sort of talk about these kinds of things. So we sort of thought just to throw all ideas into one. Um, so uh, when I started at the previous company about 10 months ago, um, there was some security, but I felt like there was a lot that could change. Um, and I focused kind of on the three main ones, although you'll see I reference AWS a lot because that's what I worked with. Um, and generally the problem was that development came first, so features, the CEO calls, he's grumpy, let's get things out, and generally that's where we, you saw that things sort of came off the rails, but um, I'll talk more about that. That's the kind of outline, hopefully we get through all of it because there's a lot to cover. Um, so. With the theme of Back to the Future, um, usually you had Dev, Sec, and Ops, and that usually broke because Dev sends it to Sec, Sec says it's a piece of crap, sends it back, or sends it through to Ops, and Ops breaks everything, or has VMs that have been alive for the last six years, and uh, uh, doesn't work. And kind of what I've found is that they all seem to actually be the same thing rather, or it makes more sense to have them work together. Um, we were a small team, Cape Town office was 10 people, so you had to work together. Um, even though I was the DevOps engineer, you kind of want to get a culture going, otherwise you're just uh, fighting upstream. And uh, at first when you kind of look at the security model for these kinds of things, AWS is this, uh, which explains it rather well. They try and cover this end and then it's quite top heavy, which is the same for most things. I mean, uh, Oracle, everyone can only guarantee the platform as much as you don't go and open up Brute and uh, press enter twice and things like that. Um, so, yeah, so kind of a lot of what you have to end up doing is it makes a lot of sense. I mean, your customer data is important. The operating system needs patching, um, server-side encryption, uh, client side, you need to HTTPS and encrypt. Um, and generally, when I started out, I was a little unsure where, where to look. And I found a lot of great, great mentorship out of Coinbase and Netflix. And our Coinbase has been hacked a couple of times. So I wouldn't say they're the perfect example. But if you go watch that YouTube video, um, the guy started out in NASA's JPL and they moved some of NASA's infrastructure into AWS, into uh, not their Gov cloud, but a more secure cloud. So they, they had a lot of lessons that they then applied to Coinbase. And uh, they have a whole DevSecOps lifecycle where devs can't actually push any code to any uh, containers without it going through a whole process. Now Netflix, on the other hand, devs have a lot of control. So AWS, they pretty much give them as much permissions as they can, and then they build open source tools to manage the damage that comes from that. So obviously a dev, a new dev might not know that certain permissions is just gonna open up everything, and you can consider that Netflix is probably one of the biggest customers at AWS, so they must have some idea of what they're doing. So uh, to kick it kind of off, I mean, if your identity and access management isn't right, which Google and Microsoft and AWS all cover, you're generally going to get your head bashed in 
Um, so generally, networking and IAM, everything was separated. Each service had a separate IAM role and separate networking. Um, so the, the great thing about AWS, it's all an API, so lots of networking can be thrown in. And um, generally, even, even on this level, it's still a bit too simple. You can break everything up into separate subnets. Uh, but it does kind of why I like this image is that they tend to talk about different clouds, and that's where generally things get quite sticky and weird. Um, so uh, the first thing we generally did is we got a PFSense box set up at the office, and the idea behind it was if AWS is a cloud, it has an API. So if we can kind of control... Our, our network a lot better. We can also control how the API works and also how the code gets into our AWS instances. So um, if you removed one of these, you could even put in a local data center. So you set up an IPsec tunnel into AWS and then we set up uh, OpenVPN into the office so that each uh, user, even when they're at home, still has access to AWS. But we have some degree of guarantee that between AWS and the office, um, through a, a AWS hosted VPN, that our traffic would be a, a lot more secure. And this got uh, interesting because then um, our, our local network had routing into AWS. So the devs had direct SSH access to VMs in AWS because I used to get irritated with how do you reverse SSH into this box so I can get to this box? Um, and this solved a lot of that problem. Um, I mean, it's a lot easier to ping directly to a box that you already know the private IP for. Or if you set up the private DNS correctly, you could even hit private DNS uh, from the office. And where, where things got interesting is considering that um, there's IAM on how you use AWS, if you were using a VPN correctly with uh, public IPs for the office, you could actually lock down all access to a AWS's API to a single IP or two IPs. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making some assumptions because of time that people kind of have an idea, but this is an IAM uh, rule where you're saying any resource on the API and any action Cannot, uh, is denied for an IP address that's not in those ranges. Um, and you could make it even more, more granular if you wanted. Um, so generally that meant that outside of the office, you couldn't even spin up an EC2 instance or hit certain S3 buckets or, or anything. Anything that we didn't want public facing um, got locked down a lot. Um, and uh, what helped us a lot as well is using tools like HashiCorp's Packet, Terraform. Um, I didn't get to a full Vault uh, integration, and we did some Ansible. And the big thing that we did with Packer is that we could have automated builds. So we take the latest uh, AWS Ubuntu image and then provision all the dependencies like Python 3.6 and everything on it. Um, and then use Terraform to build the entire infrastructure. So the networking, uh, the firewall rules, how many instances we wanted, how the networking worked together, all of that in Terraform. And then um, if you use HashiCorp Vault, the great thing about it, uh, we'll get to that a bit more, is that instead of hard coding credentials everywhere in your code, you can um, access an API and ask for credentials on runtime. So it's just stored in memory. And then Ansible, most people know uh, configuration management and setting up environments. Um, and that's just a Terraform example, so it looks a lot like code, infrastructure as code. Um, I use Google as an example because I, I default to AWS too much, but uh, you can tell it where, uh, which project, um, and it generally pulls, like with AWS, it can use your AWS credentials on your machine, so you don't have to put it in everywhere, and then you tell it how many of what uh, infrastructure you want, so how many 
Google Compute or AWS EC2 instances. So we this helps us to not lose track of our infrastructure. Otherwise, you have a bunch of VMs lying around, which I generally shut off until someone came to me and asked why, um, so that we don't have boxes that haven't been updated for two years that have uh, DP uh, security rules, uh, firewall rules open to the world. Um, and we did a lot of logging. And that was great, especially if, if you um, have no idea where to start. The ALK stack or Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana is great. Um, so what we did in, on every API, we would put a Logstash client, or even in the code itself, it would ship to a Logstash cluster that we had. So every request and response was tracked. Internal errors were tracked. So we picked up. Uh, you know, lots of uh, looking for WP admin and all of that. So you kind of like uh, tend to, after a while, filter out some of the garbage. And then Kibana is a great visualization tool um, to actually look at your data. Where did it come from? Um, what kind of request it was? Um, and response times and stuff. And the great thing about this is it's both a performance tool to some extent looking at what's actually going on in your infrastructure load-wise as well as you can set up uh, with the new version of Kibana and um, Elasticsearch. They've built in, if you use XPAC, which is their um, paid for tool or extension, they have machine learning tools to look for uh, anomalies in your data, which is uh, probably a great way to pick up um, on any security problems. And you end up building really great dashboards in Kibana. So we had all across the world, this is an example, but what we used to have is the different kind of requests coming in, how much, where in the world it was, and uh, anomalies and stuff like that. Uh, Splunk is another good example. I haven't used it myself. You've used it, right? But um, it's great for uh, big data analytics, especially with stuff like security. Um, obviously, once you've got the data, you actually have to uh, do something with it. So presenting it uh, in a, a logical way, because the problem with a lot of logging is actually reading logs. Um, and that, that becomes a problem. So I remember some of the devs used to log per day. There was one type of service we had, one gig index size in Elasticsearch per day. And that, you know, like, unless you visualize it or get the dev to fix it, you're never going to read through all of that. Um, and alerting was a great thing, and it used to irritate me, though, because at 3 a.m. I'd get SMSs for service down or something, scanning something. But instead of looking at a dashboard, you can go and uh, work out a lot of great rules for if this kind of event happens, SMS me tell me what it is, or send me an email. So even before I started, I open up my phone, I check, I know which service is being hit and what to look at already. Um, so the, down, the, the discovery time uh, comes down a lot. Sorry, I didn't mention that. I, I, I put the Back to the Future car on places that's kind of like old but new. Um, you know, monitoring's not new, alerts aren't new. Um, and Elastalert, if you're using the Logstash, uh, Kibana, and Elasticsearch stack, is a nice, uh, it's done by Yelp, uh, a YAML way of setting out rules for going through your data. And the great thing is they integrate with uh, AWS and Google Cloud, so you can have an SMS sent out on a topic to all the admins if you pick up uh, whatever um, event you're looking for. So we were talking about anomaly detection, potentially you could find a, a security anomaly and SMS the admin team and they can start looking at it immediately. Okay, so let's take over from you. <coughs> yeah, so the mandatory back to the future slide. I don't know if anyone remembers the ZDECON 2012 challenge. Okay, that was just a random question. Um, so, okay, so what's secrets management? Um, so uh, firstly, how do we do secrets management? Uh, so some of us don't, do, yeah, yeah. you either don't do it or you actually don't talk about it. So I guess that's a good way of managing your secrets. But essentially secrets management's got to do with anything you actually want to hide. So like your SH keys, your passwords, your API credentials, and all of those things. Um, two of the really good talks, uh, one of the earliest talks I could find was something at Baith, uh, 
at base set from 2012 from some uh, from Square. The stock was also the interesting when you when you actually delve into secret management. Um, a lot of the talks are given by software engineers um, that kind of had these um, infosec kind of problems, and they come up with some solutions. So, the talk from um, Nathan McCauley and Justin Cummings is actually a really interesting talk if you can get access to it. And then also uh, turtles all the way down from 2015. AppSec is a really good talk just to give you an overview of the landscape of secrets management, what it all entails. Um, I put that there so you can actually get much better talks from those guys. Um, but every talk after it either references this particular talk or it's selling your product. Um, we have to talk about secrets management. Okay, so grab this just. It tells you like it's basically a really good overview of secrets management. Um, gives you really good, it's not updated, but you can also update it. There's quite a lot of forks, and you can fork it and just get updated, but it indexes all of the tools on there, right? So, um, if you're talking about the cloud, uh, I've seen the talk is kind of just a really good overview. You actually just want to look into these four products, which is, um, uh, I actually call Vault, you have AWS's key management system, Google Cloud's key management, and Azure Key Vault, right? Um, a lot of the actual tools that are out there are either did, done by Square, HashiCorp, Pinterest, Cloudflare, Lyft, Stack Exchange, um, or Mozilla, and they kind of integrate with your HSMs, and some of them are compliant, right? Flips compliance and those things. So there's quite a lot of good tools out, out over there. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, so there's quite a lot of tools, and they solve particular problems to particular domains, and you'll probably find out everything there. So this is just kind of like uh, a good Shakespeare novel. You have like the illusion, the reality. This is the illusion. Um, it looks really easy. You kind of get Vault. Vault sits in your infrastructure. You um, have a client. You create it with some token. And you write to come some kind of key value store and you get it back, right? Um, that's the illusion. And I guess um, this is the reality. Um, yeah. So you kind of integrate with Vault. You draw some policies. And you do the rest of the fucking integration. Um, this is actually from... Uh, Reactors. Her talk is um, in track one after coffee. It's a really good uh, post, uh, but you can actually check a talk out over there. But she goes about how do you actually um, do this? Uh, how you integrate Vault? So the kind of gist of this is you need to know your problem domain first, or understand your system, your solution. You don't just throw Vault at it and it solves it. There's probably something you, you need to kind of understand your context, how you want to manage secrets and those things, right? Um, so kind of like. Um, Back to the ZDECON 2012 thing, kind of burn all your sticky notes. Um, personally, get a password manager, so your own secrets. I think it's good to start at home. Um, if you're a dev and you're kind of working with these things, look into something called Nth Chain and Nth uh, DR. It's um, for your application, so you can kind of hide your environment variables and those things. Uh, and I would honestly say read, read, read. Like, that's probably the best thing. you do. If someone tells you, like, just use Vault, um, I would tell them, um, are you Quibus? Um <laughs> That's basically uh, what I'd say to them, and I'd say they read a lot. And then, just final warning, focus on secrets management first and keeping your secrets uh, uh, keeping your secrets secure and secret. Like, you can whatever the latest, but every solution has that. Um, don't write your own secrets management solution at, at work. <laughs> kind of rather do it. Um, rather use some existing uh, open source solution. So like I said, like it's kind of like cooking uh, meth. You don't cook it at work. You rather do it at home and you do it with caution. Um, um, so, yeah. um, so back to kind of a scanning uh, thing. So the problem, especially with the AWS or Google or Azure environment, is that there's so much to look at even in the console. Forget about the CLI. Um, just security rules, which is in AWS world, firewall rules. I had to look through about 40 different security groups to find all the uh, everyone's ADSL uh, public IP that they put in there that obviously had expired already and then filled up all the security groups so we couldn't add any more. Um, th and that's uh, kind of why the VPN made a lot of sense is that people kept putting craft into everything just so they could get in. and. Uh, I do like Netflix's idea of giving access to all the the devs because otherwise they become uh, unproductive, but you have to manage it to some extent. I mean, putting your home's ADSL, which gets switched so often in, is really not the best way to do it. Um, definitely to mention Security Monkey. 
uh, and Prowler are great tools to actually just go through your uh, security groups and I am and then a wasp zap to throw in a wasp thing um, much like burp suite uh, but uh, there's a lot of work being done to use it in a CI environment. So a good example would be Salesforce uh, uses it to scan all their third-party plugins um, with it. So Security Monkey kind of looks like that. Um, it's quite a bit of a system because they're storing with uh, Postgres a kind of snapshot of what it used to be, and then it goes and scans AWS, and it gives you an idea of where to go and look which accounts or which uh, policies give too much uh, access. And it's rather ironic that S3 is on there because that's usually the biggest culprit and DJI got burnt by that recently. Um, and that's also a hard problem to solve, especially with devs. S3 can give you a static website, but also can store logs and other things. So to, to constantly check those things yourself is a bit of a pain with Security Monkey um, gives you a good place to start and uh, oh goodness that slide you can't see but that was just a wasp zap and uh, working it into CI and if you actually need to it, it's difficult to actually go through talks and just imagine how how it would work to get in but um, Keegan actually shared this with me, and this is a great way to actually find out what could go wrong. So someone went and set up an AWS account and did it wrong on purpose to show you how S3 is a problem, how um, your IAM roles have too many permissions or your users. So um, just using AWS as CLI, you start getting things back with flaws, and there's different challenges and steps that you go through. Uh, and find different things and then get more access and more access and more access. And by doing something like this, you generally also then start thinking about your own infrastructure. What's too open? What should I lock down? And sort of a general conclusion, I think I've actually missed some slides that I must have forgotten to put back in. But anyway, uh, soldering. Uh, so... Uh, to get back to DevSecOps, what I found for doing it for kind of nine months at one company is that uh, you have to work into your sprints, that you have to think about security and the ops around it. You can't just leave it for later, um, especially with all, uh, when you're doing the DevOps with Terraform and Packer and everything. You're already doing the work, work in the security side of things there. Um, and CI for infrastructure and scanning. So most of our our infrastructure was built by uh, Bitbucket's pipelines, uh, just because that was what we were using at the time. But um, you can track builds that have happened. There's, uh, they're on AWS's infrastructure already, so it's easily easy to isolate their uh, public IP range uh, with security groups, even with a VPN. Um, and you can use CI for scanning, so things like um, uh, the kind of flaws, problems, you can go and look at each one, set up tools and scan uh, on a nightly basis. CI for code deployment, so you don't have a dev just going in and SSHing and vim, change everything, put in the API keys everywhere, uh, work it into sprints, and... Um, what I do like about Netflix's approach is if they find a problem with giving devs too much access, they build a tool for it. So just like they have Chaos Monkey to kill things, they have uh, a security monkey to help lock things down, and they have a lot of other products um, and Q&A. Otherwise, I can talk about other things that I didn't put in necessarily. Uh, yeah, see, that's a difficult one. So obviously, you have to do... AWS gives you a lot of tools to encrypt everything that you're putting in there. Um, but you'll find that even the big guys get burned. So take an example like that. Uh, the CIA and Lockheed Martin got burned 
in the last two years by having things on an S3 bucket that was open to the world. So they had to give students in the U.S. Uh, access because they were working on projects for them, and then people just found troves and troves of documents. So I, that's where something like Security Monkey comes in. Constantly scan for that kind of thing because um, AWS enables, right? But it also enables you to burn yourself. I mean, they can't do everything. That's where that shared security model comes in. But, I mean, in that, that case... I mean, nobody likes disclosing, but disclosing is the first thing. And if you've put in the right me uh, measures, you should be all right. And uh, remember that the uh, cyber crimes law might get passed in the next year. So then you might become liable for that kind of thing more than you are now. So <laughs> secure it now rather than later. Actually, sorry, I need to actually go into detail. So we had two kind of guard accounts, me and CTO, and then all the devs got just enough access for them to do their jobs. So quite a lot, but not delete things in DynamoDB. Um, like, for instance, uh, CI could kill and launch instances, but devs could only launch instances, not kill them. So with IAM roles and policies, you can lock it down a lot, and then uh, you can actually check, I think, in Cloud Trail, you can actually monitor what the users are doing. So if you... Some of the stuff. Yes, some of the stuff. So you can add more things if you need to. If you add a log stash and you monitor per host, you should be able to see that someone's launched another API that that's not in the autoscale group. Um, but it, it is that tussle between enable and disable. So it's kind of a carrot and a stick thing. Give the VPN. Look, you can SSH directly to 10, 10, 10, 0, 0, 6, 250 versus here's a jump box that hasn't been updated for the last six months, use that. Um, and uh, the, the big thing is actually explaining it to the devs. I had to explain it a couple of times and eventually they get used to it. Um, the VPN helped them in the end. It was annoying getting uh, Ubuntu's DNS to work sometimes, but in the end it made a lot of sense. Just point out, it's actually quite a good book. Um, there's a book, I think it's called Agile. Yeah, so I think one thing that I could mention is using Packer, you as the ops or DevOps team can sort of create images that the devs can use, but you know that a lot of what's on it already has monitoring, um, you've added security tools, uh, otherwise they're just going to pull anyone's AMI off the AWS marketplace. So it's it's a lot of work in the background, but then getting the dev team to play with. And uh, what also what I didn't mention a lot of is we we had generally we were in one region. We were thinking of going to another region, but that was later on. But then in that region, we split things up with VPCs and then subnets. So each each service had its own subnet and security rules. So the API can talk to both uh, Redis and MySQL, but MySQL can't talk to Redis, that kind of thing. And then we had to host a, uh, I should have put that in. I, I did it in the previous talk. We had to host a WordPress, my, the bane of my existence. So we put it in a different region and different VPC in a different security group. Like literally that, the only thing that it linked it to us was our AWS account. And there you could create organizations, you could do dev, prod, QA. Um, Segmentation is the biggest thing that helped us quite a bit. So um, Lambda was completely separate and a separate VPC. And partially that is also just because Lambda needs a lot of IPs. 
but then you can give it uh, access, it's called peering between VPCs, and then you set up rules that only certain services are peering. So the more you segment, the more you use DevOps, tool, DevOps tools like Terraform, you can actually reproduce that. Anyone else? Yeah. The other tools are maybe free or open source, but Splunk is expensive. I mean, if you're trying to ch uh, chunk up a lot of logging into it, it will cost you basically your business. <laughs> and the other thing, uh, the flaws um, and like website to test the uh, Yeah. The, the, the knowledge you get is, is very valuable. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the barrier to entry is great because you're mostly using the AWS CLI, which anyone who's using AWS is already doing. Um, to go to Splunk, I mentioned it because a lot of people tend to mention it, but we didn't have the luxury of buying all the licenses. I mean, we were running Elasticsearch without XPAC as well, but then you you start tooling around that. So we ran a lot of Lambda functions, checking infrastructure, sending out SNS alerts. So it's either build or buy. But we tended to buy uh, to build as much as we can. Um, and something like Elastalert works fairly well. Kibana works really well. And Grafana can pull in from Elasticsearch. It pulls in from, sorry, that's maybe something I could have mentioned. If you want to look at a centralized sort of dashboard, Grafana is pretty good because it has AWS and uh, Google Cloud and other support. It has Elasticsearch support. So it just pulls in all all the data and you just visualize it as much as you can. Although I, I didn't spend enough time on Grafana. I stuck to Kibana most of the time. You also push, pushes like stuff because Splunk is quite expensive and they're also using a nice alert. It's, it's a good talk that he gives. I don't know what's the name of the talk, but if you just Google Slack, it's automating security or something. It's also a really good kind of talk. But yeah. Thank you.